Okay, so now let's turn to some of the overarching principles and some of the rules regarding employment discrimination that have been passed separately from the Civil Rights Act, and some of these things will have be part of the Civil Rights Act. First of all, we've got the Equal Pay Act, which was just actually recently, just a few years ago, there was a separate uh, this Equal Pay Act, the Lilly Ledbetter uh, Equal Pay Act. And what this does is it protects both genders, both sexes, from, dis from pay discrimination based on gender. Uh, this, what this says is that if you have jobs that have equal skill, that require equal effort, equal responsibility with similar working conditions, then the, and you have male and female employees that are doing these, the same things that are similar, you have to give them equal wages. Now, it's hard to enforce these things, obviously, because it's hard to prove equality, but there can be cases and have been cases brought to enforce that. Why would you be able to justify a difference in wage if you have men and women, for whatever reason, getting different, or people of different races getting different uh, treatment? Well, as we discussed before, you've got seniority or merit, just like with race discrimination, quantity or quality of the product produced, if one person is better at producing, then that person can be, can obviously get a different wage. And any factor other than gender can be used to justify a difference in wages, but the employer bears the burden of proving these defenses. So, for example, if you establish that be, that that be other people, you know, the uh, people uh, that men are getting one wage and women are getting another wage, the employer's got to figure out a way to prove a justification for that distinction. There's also the ADEA. The ADEA is the Age Discrimination in Employment Act. And the Age Discrimination in Employment Act is similar to the race-based employment laws. And what this does it is it prohibits age discrimination in employment decisions, including hiring, promotion, payment of compensation, other terms of employment. And what this was based on the idea that there is discrimination sometimes where people want younger workers because people are worried that older people are not going to be as energetic or they're going to retire sooner or they're not going to be able to work as much, whatever it is. And these are base and this is what the Age Discrimination in Employment Act is based on. It only applies to employees who are 40 years of age or older. If you're 38 or 39 or 21, for example, you can't, if, it's, if you're too young, that's not a good enough uh, reason to sue. If you say, well, I'm 19 and therefore I'm getting discriminated against, uh, discriminated against too bad. <laughs> you're not protected by the Age Discrimination and Employment Act unless you're over 40. Uh, it covers employers who cannot establish mandatory retirement ages covered employers, excuse me, can't establish mandatory retirement ad ages. You cannot say, unless, again, unless there's a really good reason, unless there's a BFOQ, which we discussed before, unless there's a bona fide occupational qualification that requires that people of a certain age can't do a job for whatever reason, you cannot establish minimum retirement ages. And it's also administered by the Equal, Opportunity Employment, uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Establishing man mandatory retirement ages would be unfair because just because a person is 66 or 67 or even 70 years old doesn't inherently mean they can't do most jobs. Now, if the person is simply not able to do it anymore for whatever reason, it requires physical strength, and now a 75-year-old just doesn't have the physical strength, well, then, of course, you can fire that person. You can lay off that person simply because the person can't do the work anymore. That's not what age-based discrimination means. Age-based discrimination means discriminating against s uh, someone based solely on their age. Another very important statute that's relevant to employment discrimination is the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, and this imposes on employers, and not just employers, also providers of public transportation, public accommodations, to accommodate people in individuals with disabilities. That's one reason why you see ramps and elevators, uh, handicapped parking spots in, in most public buildings that were built after a certain a certain uh, date. Basically, I mean, there are older buildings are grandfathered. They don't have to be knocked down and, and rebuilt. But newer buildings, even even buildings that are not owned by the public, you know, buildings that are uh, that are that are office buildings, are required to have certain disability accommodations. And Title I of the ADA prohibits employment discrimination against people who are qualified but have disabilities. And it also, just like with religion, Title I requires an employer to make reasonable accommodations that do not cause undue hardship to the employer. Installation of an elevator, installation of a ramp, uh, installation of a special workstation, if it doesn't cause a huge undue burden to the employer, then the employer has to make the accommodation.
Reasonable accommodations may include making facilities readily accessible, modifying work schedules. You know, maybe somebody with, uh, with some sort of a problem can't sit at a desk for eight hours, so maybe the person will be given an accommodation where they can work in four-hour shifts instead of eight-hour shifts. Uh, acquiring equipment or devices, modifying examination or training materials. And the schools very often are asked to do this, give people with certain disabilities extra time or a person, a person to, uh, you know, to read them, to read them the work, etc. Also, these limitations are, spe are limited, I'm sorry, these requirements are limited when the to when the qualified individual with a disability ha is qualified to do the job. If the person is not qualified to do the job, well then of course you don't have to make an accommodation. You don't have to allow the person to work for you if the person is going, not going to be able to do the job. How do you determine whether somebody has a disability? Remember, not everybody is covered by the ADA. You're only covered by the ADA. You can only sue based on the ADA and get an accommodation based on the ADA if you have a disability. A disability is someone who has a medical, a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or, your, one or more of his or her major life activities, has a record, and is regarding of having such impairment. Physical impairment like um, being blind or being uh, wheelchair bound or something like that obviously is a disability. There was actually a case a number of years back about what if you have a disease that doesn't show up, but you have to make certain lifestyle changes uh, based on that disease? Um, it just that you can't do certain things because you have a disease, but it doesn't impact you at all on a day-to-day -day basis. And I believe the courts basically ruled that that's not considered a dis disability because it doesn't bother you on a day-to-day -day basis. What about, so what is the requirement of an employee regarding the Americans with Disabilities Act, regarding disabled people? Well, first of all, employers are forbidden from asking about the existence or severity of a disability. I can't ask, you know, are you wheelchair bound? Are you, can you, can you walk normally? Now, again, there's that BFOQ exception. If it's something, if, if the, <laughs> if, if the uh, job is an Olympic sprinter <laughs> and somebody is wheelchair bound, well, you know, I don't know if there is such thing as a job, the job of a wheelchair sp um, a sprinter, but if if a person is, you know, if, if the job is a, is a lifeguard and the person because of a disability can't swim, I mean, it's, it's common sense that the ADA doesn't protect that person. But, um, pre uh, also, but you cannot discriminate if, it is, if a person can't, uh, if a person, for example, is wheelchair bound, but it's a desk job, it doesn't require uh, somebody to actually walk around, well, then you can't even ask about that when you're hiring the person in the first place. Uh, Pre-employment medical examinations are also forbidden before a job offer is established. You have to essentially give the person a job offer, and once you do that, once the person starts working for you, then you can give the person a medical uh, evaluation. But if the person does have a disability, you have to give a reasonable accommodation. Okay, two last points for the course. First of all, we've got this idea of affirmative action. Now, affirmative action is a policy that private companies can pick up Government policies or government uh, jobs or schools, again, can enact these policies, but they don't necessarily have to. Uh, and that is a policy that certain job preferences, or let's say school admission preferences, will be given to minority or protected class applicants when an employer uh, makes an employment decision. Now, that is allowed in certain cases, but it's certainly not required. Basically, th what this is, is when, let's say, for example, you have a government contractor and they realize that, you know, 95% of their employees are white and that, that's because in the past there had been discrimination and because of that they have this hu hugely white workforce and very few minorities on their workforce. Well, they might say, okay, you know, from now on for a while we're going to start giving some preferences in hiring to minority applicants so that we will, A, reverse the, fa the effect of past discrimination, and second of all, we will kind of make sure that our workforce is kind of a little bit more in line with the general population uh, ratios. And that's that can be done. There are certain circumstances in which the Supreme Court has disallowed
allowed it. For example, when a school said, you know, we're going to set aside 15 students, 15 seats in every incoming class for people who are minorities, the Supreme Court said, you know, that's going a little too far. You can't set aside a certain number of seats, but you can give race-based preferences. That, of course, gives rise to the question of reverse discrimination, because the idea, the whole Title VII, the whole employment discrimination rules, they apply to people who are part of the majority class just as much as they apply to the minority class. Uh, it protects black people from discrimination, but it also protects white people from discrimination. You know, it protects Jews and Muslims from discrimination, but it also protects Christians from discrimination. It protects women from discrimination, but it also protects uh, men from discrimination. So. Um, affirmative action plans, actions that we discussed, have been allowed based on these criteria because they are needed to reverse past discrimination and to normalize the workforce. But affirmative action plans may not have pre-established numbers of quotas, as I mentioned. And finally, uh, majority class members, just like minority class members who are being discriminated against, can recover damages or get other remedies. And those are all the material, that's all the material we have for this course. I want to thank everybody for listening. I hope you've gained uh, some insight uh, into the course materials based on this video. Uh, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.